I have the information that we are now online. We are now streaming on YouTube. Uh, so, hello everyone. I think we are now online. Um, welcome and uh, thank you to everyone that is on on uh, the other side waiting for us. And uh, I have thank the you. Information Oops. that we are now online. And uh, thank you for your presence. I'm sorry for this slight delay. Um, thank you for your presence on this World B Day. Uh, my name is Marta Santos. I am responsible for the communication office of the Center for Ecology, Evolution and Environmental Changes here in Portugal. We are one of the organizers of this initiative. Um, the other organizer is the Portuguese uh, Society for Entomology. Um, uh, the Vice President, uh, Vice President Carla Rego is also here today. And I'll, I will give the floor to her in a few minutes. And we also have today uh, here our renowned speaker, Dave Balsam, to whom I thank for accepting this invitation and with whom I will also give the floor in a few minutes. Uh, in the backstage of YouTube, we have with us Maria Castaneda, also of the communication office of C3C. She's ensuring that everything is going well of, with the technical parts. So if you see any interventions there in the, in the chat of the YouTube, it's Maria. And if you have any questions during the talk, please feel free to put them in the chat and we will try to, to put them some of the questions to our speaker after the talk. So this is our second session during this week to celebrate the World Bee Day. Um, and uh, so as I said, we are commemorating or celebrating the World Bee Day during this week. Uh, just very briefly, I will share with you the, this, the talks that we will have during this uh, week. Let me share the screen with you. Here it is. So this is the only talk that is in English. I don't know if we have any English speakers there on the other side of the screen. Uh, but on Thursday, tomorrow, we have another talk about the behavior of the pollinators of Maseru uh, by Ricardo Costa, a researcher here at C3C at our research center. And we end the week with another talk by researcher Sonia Ferreira, who will present the research project Pollinators of Portugal. So we always meet here at the YouTube channel of C3C at 5.30 p.m. Uh, Lisbon time. So let me bring back the screen to me. So thank you again for um, being with us today. I now give the floor to my colleague, Carla Rego. Thank you, Marta. Welcome everyone to this talk. You are here not to hear me, but to hear Professor Dave Golson. Uh, I welcome you to the World Bee Day celebration at home edition. Last year, we had the opportunity to organize several activities outside, much more agreeable. Uh, but this year, due to the pandemic, we are restricted to do this safely from our homes. So, Professor Golson is a professor of biology at the University of Sussex. He specialized in bee ecology. He has published more than almost 300 scientific papers on this subject, uh, on the conservation of bumblebees and other insects. He is the author of the textbook of bumblebees, their behavior, ecology, and conservation, as well as sci uh, several scientific books that I recommend vividly. If anyone hasn't read them yet, it's good good reading anytime where you want. He also founded the Bumblebee Conservation Trust in 2006, a charity that has now grown to more than 1,200, uh, 12, members and he has developed a, a very interesting work on, con on Bumblebee Conservation. He also has received several prestigious awards and in 2015 was named number eight at the top 15 most influential people in conservation. So now I have to thank Professor Dave Golson for accepting our invitation and I give the floor to him. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation to be here. 
Um, I'm still fairly new to giving Zoom presentations, so uh, you'll just have to bear with me a second. I'm just going to bring my slides up. Uh, as I say, um, hopefully, no, no, hang on, hang on. That's no good. Uh, should have got this going beforehand, but it was. Okay, why am I going on? Sorry, I'll get this right in a second. No, no my computer's frozen. This is some. Um, Okay, and I, I'm nearly there, I promise. <laughs> this is gross incompetence, and I made things worse by being late as well, but I'm nearly there. All of us are new at this. Let us know if you want us to be sharing your presentation. We have it no, no, it's, it's, it's fine, it's fine. I'm very nearly there. I just had some slight teething problems with getting it to appear on the right screen. Okay, so now if I go here, and I share my screen, we should finally be, what's, why have I not got, hang on. <sighs> I, my computer's doing some strange things at the moment. Um, I have no idea why, but there we go. So, uh, Why can I not go to share screen? Something going wrong with my computer, I'm afraid. This is embarrassing. It's uh, okay. Ah, it's starting. Yeah, but I'm in... Um, there we go. Finally, I do apologize. We're there. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the impacts of pesticides on bees after all of that faffing about. Um, I, I've been studying bees for, for a long time, but came to, uh, to work on the impacts of pesticides on bees relatively late, um, about 10 years, I guess, um, I've been working on this, um, stimulated by uh, the controversy that blew up over the impacts of neonicotinoid insecticides on bees. But since then, I've become more broadly in, interested in the overall effects of pesticides, of many different pesticides on bees. And it's quite a complicated and controversial area. But to start off, the, the, the background to that is that um, insects are in decline. I think most people, uh, most rational people accept that there seems to be a crisis in the insect world. Um, one that we weren't fully aware of until relatively recently. And I think it was really brought to the forefront of um, public attention by a study from Germany, um, sometimes called the Krefeld study, which was uh, uh, where a, a group of entomologists in Germany um, uh, ran malaise traps. This is a malaise trap top right there, which um, catch flying insects, all types of insects. And this graph shows you the, the daily biomass of insects um, caught and how it changed between 1989 and 2016. And you can see pretty clearly it declined a lot. Uh, it actually declined by about 76% in 26 years, which is dramatic and actually pretty terrifying if insects are really disappearing that quickly. Um, we, we don't have identical data for anywhere else to compare, so we can't be absolutely sure that the same patterns are occurring in Portugal or the United Kingdom or whatever, but we do have other evidence that suggests that this is um, uh, more widespread than just Germany, probably in fact global. And I'm just gonna show you a couple of other lines of evidence, starting with, so we don't really have good quantitative data on wild pollinator populations anywhere, um, but we do have good maps for many of them, and they often show alarming declines. Um, so for example, this is a UK bumblebee species, or at least a species that's found in the UK amongst other places. And this shows you its distribution in the first half of the 20th century. This is, his Latin name is Bombus distinguendus. 
um, and sadly it disappeared over time. So that's the second half of the 20th century and today. So it's shown major range contractions, um, particularly northward range contractions, which um, seems to be a common feature. Um, and clearly something's going wrong for this species uh, and in fact for many others. Um, so this then shows you also from the UK, sorry for giving you lots of UK examples, but we're busy collecting data here um, and we probably have as good a data as anywhere in the world as to what's happening. Um, this shows you, this is from a study by Gary Powney that was published last year, which shows you how the range sizes of wild bees, the blue line, and uh, hoverflies um, in the UK have changed over time. So there are 139 species of bee included in that blue line. And, and essentially what the line is tracking is the average range size per, across species between 1980 and, and 2012. And you can see that both hoverflies and bees, their ranges are contracting, just as that last species I showed you, Bombus distinguendus, has. So why, what's driving these declines? Well, most people agree it's a number of things. It's certainly not all to do with pesticides. A lot of it is to do with habitat loss, loss of things like Top right there is a beautiful flower-rich grassland, um, of which Europe used to have many flower-rich grasslands, huge tracts of them, and much of them were lost in the, in the 20th century, and that was a, a big blow to, to bees in particular. But then also the way farming has changed has, has involved lots more pesticides being used and the movement towards heavy mechanization, more fertilizers, bigger fields, and so on. And we can, it's, it's pretty obvious how all the, the way the landscape changed and the way farming changed in the 20th century was a big driver of insect declines. Um, but we, we largely stopped making fields bigger and ripping out hedges and so on uh, in the late 20th century. So um, the European Union moved towards a system uh, of paying farmers to uh, to, to, to look after biodiversity. So in the 1990s, a whole uh, bunch of agri-environment schemes were introduced in Europe, things like sowing payments for sowing flower strips along the edges of fields. Um, and yet, wildlife, particularly insect life, continues to decline. The, the German data I showed you are almost entirely in the period after agri-environment schemes were introduced. So despite our best efforts, insect life seems to be declining. Why is that? Well, I don't have a definitive answer for you, but one's argument might be that it's to do with the impacts of pesticides. Uh, just bear with me for five seconds while I shut the door that's behind me. I have a, a turkey in the garden and for some reason it's decided to, to make a lot of noise outside and uh, I thought maybe you might be able to hear it, which would be somewhat off-putting. Um, okay, so, so could it be that these ongoing declines of insects are due to uh, our use of pesticides? Well, we certainly use a lot of pesticides these days. Um, apologies for putting up this, this bewildering table with long names on it, but this um, this, this is uh, data on the pesticides and the, the chemicals used on one field, um, what is, happens to be an oilseed rape field um, in the south of the United Kingdom. It's a local farmer close to where I work. Um, and we were studying the effects of pesticides on bees on his farm. And we asked him if he'd share with us all the pesticides that he used on each field. And he very kindly did so along with other farmers. And this is a fairly typical field. Um, it was a field of oilseed rape sown in August, 2012 and harvested in June, 2013. So these data are a little bit old now, but I don't think things have changed much. Uh, and this is just a list by date of the chemicals applied to the field. There are a couple of fertilizers in there, but 20 different pesticides going onto one field um, in one growing season. 
which struck me as I, I was amazed um, when I first saw this. I couldn't quite believe it. Do we really use so many chemicals? But actually, if you, I then looked at government figures for um, collected in the UK on pesticide use. And um, on average, each arable field is treated 17.4 times a year with pesticides in the United Kingdom. And that's a figure that's nearly doubled in the last 25 years. So uh, the number of applications per field seems to be increasing. And these pesticides include many that are of concern to insects, to bees. Um, uh, so the orange ones I've highlighted include um, insecticides. And as you can see, there's a whole range of different insecticides going onto this crop, different stages of its growth. And I've also highlighted a couple of, uh, in purple, a couple of um, fungicides, which in themselves are not particularly toxic to uh, insects, but have been discovered to act synergistically with um, insecticides. So the fungicides block the detoxification mechanism of the bees, which then makes uh, insecticides much more toxic effectively if, if an insect is simultaneously exposed to the fungicide and the insecticide. And given that, that they're both being used on the same crop at the same time, then it's very likely that bees are going to be exposed to a combination uh, of different pesticides, including the fungicide and the insecticide. And just as a, as a quick aside, this highlights immediately one of the fundamental failings with the regulatory system for pesticides in Europe and globally, which is that it looks at the effects of one chemical at a time on bees. But in reality, bees in the real world are exposed to a whole cocktail of chemicals um, and we have a really poor understanding of how that exposure might affect them. Anyway, we use a lot of pesticides in modern farming. That said, you might think uh, that pesticides today are better regulated than they used to be, and that modern pesticides are probably safer than older generations of pesticides. And um, it's certainly true that, that um, the regulatory system is probably better than it was 50 years ago. So are modern pesticides safer for bees than older ones? Well, this rather ugly chart um, is from a paper I published in Peer J a couple of years ago. Um, it's, it's again, it's UK data. Um, uh, the government publishes data on, on all pesticide use in farming um, each year. And what I've done here is, uh, is calculated, it's a slightly strange calculation perhaps, I calculated how many honeybees you could kill uh, or, or how many LD50 doses you could give basically using, if you took all the pesticides applied in any particular year and you fed them to honeybees, how many bees might you kill? Um, and I, I plotted here how that changes over time. And you can see that actually it increases a lot, increases about sixfold. Um, it seems that modern pesticides um, are actually potentially more dangerous, more poisonous to honeybees than the ones that were being used 25 years ago, six times more toxic. Uh, so maybe things aren't getting better for our insects. Now that's just farming use, of course, we should also bear in mind that there's a lot of other use of pesticides and, and it's very difficult to get uh, figures for how much uh, uh, these other uses comprise, but um, certainly there's a lot of domestic use of pesticides. You can go to a garden center or uh, a DIY shop or even a supermarket these days and buy pesticides for home use um, uh, and also local Authorities, local councils um, apply them to public spaces, road verges, parks, and so on. And we have very little idea how many are used in these kind of areas. Um, even if, I, I guess, many people listening might be keen on making their garden um, bee friendly and probably grow bee friendly flowers to feed the honeybees and the bumblebees and so on. Um, and Garden centres in, in uh, many countries uh, sell ornamental flowers and they label the ones 
which are bee friendly uh, with some kind of bee logo or butterfly logo. Um, but they too are very often full of pesticides. We studied this in my lab at Sussex. Um, we bought bee friendly plants from the local garden centers and screened them for pesticides and 75% of them contained insecticides. And these, these are being sold to people as bee friendly, which I think is, is pretty outrageous. 70% um, of them, this was in 2017, 70% of the plants we bought contained neonicotinoid insecticides, um, which I mentioned earlier and we'll come back to in a second. Uh, so I think that, that one way or another, there are a lot of pesticides going into the landscape, be it in gardens or in farmland. Um, one final route of potential contamination of um, of urban areas in particular with pesticides is, is this one. And you might think I'm going a bit crazy at this point because this is a flea treatment that's applied to dogs and cats, very commonly recommended by uh, veterinary surgeons to use prophylactically to prevent your pet from, uh, from getting fleas. Um, now, the active ingredients in the most popular selling brands are neonicotinoid insecticides and you, they're really big doses. So um, this particular one, Advocate, the active ingredient is imidacloprid. You can just see in tiny font on that uh, label there. Um, imidacloprid has now been banned for use by farmers, but it's still legal to put it on your dog or cat. Um, and the amount you're supposed to drip on the neck of your dog every month is enough to kill 60 million honeybees. Um, uh, and these are long lasting, quite persistent chemicals that are water soluble. So if your dog goes out in the rain or gets wet or jumps in a river, then that's a big dose of insecticide going into the river, which is probably not a good thing. Okay, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about neonicotinoids, which because they've become um, so controversial and they're probably the first pesticide that springs to mind when talking about um, pesticides and bee declines. You may wonder why I'm still talking about them given that three of them have been banned, but I'll explain why in a few moments. So neonicotinoids um, are a group of neurotoxic insecticides introduced in the 1990s. They uh, block open acetylcholine receptors in insect brains. Uh, and cause paralysis and death at a high enough dose. Um, there are several different chemical variants. They're all synthetic versions of nicotine. Um, and they became very popular mainly for use as seed dressings. So those bluish things are oilseed rape seeds coated in um, a neonicotinoid. So the farmer buys them pre-treated and just sows them in the ground. Um, I'll explain how that's supposed to work in a second. So they're mostly used as seed dressings, although there are various other uses. Um, and um, in the UK alone, uh, latest figures from, 20, uh, from 2015 I'm showing there, there's about 110,000 kilos of neonicotinoids went into the UK landscape in that year. Um, that's increased a lot over time. They proved to be very popular. Farmers liked this system of not having to spray, of just buying seeds pre-treated, and they were pushed by agronomists um, as the latest and most effective crop protection for farmers and became uh, widely used around the world. Um, as you can see there, again, it's UK data, but you'd get the same pattern from almost anywhere in the world. Um, neonicotinoids became the most popular insecticides uh, uh, globally. As I say, they're neurotoxic and they're extremely toxic in tiny amounts um, to, uh, to bees and other insects. So the toxicity of pesticides is measured as an LD50, which stands for the lethal dose that kills 50%. Um, and I've just put up the LD50s for four different pesticides there. Um, uh, four different insecticides. First one's imidacloprid, which is a neonicotinoid. Um, and then the others are, are slightly older generations of uh, going back to DDT, um, which has long since been banned, but was of course an insecticide. And the reason I'm showing you this is that the, the dose needed to, to 
kill a honeybee is much, much smaller for the neonicotinoid than for the older generations of insecticide. In fact, DDT, which is notorious for the environmental harm it did, is about 7,000 times less poisonous weight for weight to a, to a honeybee than imidacloprid is. It takes just four nanograms of imidacloprid to give a lethal dose to a honeybee, which means that one teaspoon, five grams of imidacloprid, is enough to kill one and a quarter billion honeybees. And bear in mind that just in the UK, we're applying 110,000 kilos of this stuff to the landscape every year, then clearly there's the potential to kill an awful lot of bees, or there was until we banned them. As well as directly killing bees, um, it, it emerged after a number of years of research that um, neonicotinoids and other insecticides too, have a whole suite of sublethal effects, which may be more important than the lethal effects. If a bee gets a dose below the lethal dose, it survives, but it may be severely impaired in its activities. It may be unable to navigate back to the nest, which is a disaster, obviously, for a bee. If it's a queen, it may have reduced fecundity, lay fewer eggs, or if it's a male, it might produce less sperm. It may have impaired learning, uh, and perhaps most significantly, there's clear evidence that neonicotinoids um, impaired the immune system of bees, meaning that um, diseases such as viral diseases like deformed wing virus can replicate more rapidly in bees that have received a really small dose of the insecticide. And so theoretically, you could have a situation where a honeybee hive might appear to die due to an outbreak of deformed wing virus, but actually the ultimate cause was the immune system being knocked out by the pesticide. So I mentioned that these neonicotinoids were used as seed dressings. Um, that was about 90% of European use. Um, and I'm just gonna explain here what goes wrong. So farmers, thought this was a really nice system because it saved them effort. They just bought the treated seeds and sowed them straight in the ground. And what was supposed to happen was that the seed coating, that little blue seed coating on the oilseed rapeseed or the wheat seed or whatever, it, they're water soluble so that it dissolves in the damp soil. And then as the seedling grows, it sucks up the pesticide and they're systemic and they go to all parts of the plant and protect it against insect herbivores which sounds fantastic, except there are some slight problems. Uh, firstly, a little bit of dust usually blows off in the drilling process, and that can be highly toxic to any insects that happen to be nearby. Um, but much more significantly, if you actually look at how much pesticide is in the crop, it's only about 5% on average of the amount put on the seed. So most of it isn't going into the crop at all. About 94% of the active ingredient is going into the soil and the soil water from where it can be, it can accumulate over time. It can be taken up by the roots of any wildflowers or hedgerow plants growing next to the crop, or it can seep into streams uh, and rivers and so on, which is, is not ideal. Um, and so here, for example, is what is evidence of widespread contamination of rivers with neonicotinoids um, so this is, is obviously the UK again. Um, uh, the orange and red spots are rivers where the levels of neonicotinoids found in rivers um, exceed those that can be expected to be killing aquatic insects. Um, uh, and if you know anything about the UK uh, farming, you'll know that uh, the, the intensively farmed region is in the south and the east, which is exactly where the orange and red spots can be can be seen here. So these chemicals are polluting our rivers. Um, they're also, to get back to the subject of bees, polluting our bees or polluting our bees' food. Um, so here are some data from a, a global study by uh, Mitchell and Co that was published in 2017. It's quite an interesting study. They simply asked people going on holiday to, to bring them back a sample of honey and they screened the honeys for neonicotinoid insecticides. Uh, and if you perhaps ignore the bar charts, which are of less significance, and just look at the little dots scattered all over the world, 
Um, the darker the colour, the, the higher the concentration of neonicotinoid um, they found. And roughly three quarters of global honey samples were contaminated with these neurotoxic insecticides. That basically means that three quarters of all the honeybees in the world are being chronically exposed to chemicals designed to kill insects, um, which is deeply disturbing. And of course, it also means it's not just honeybees. Um, if honeybees are being exposed, then very likely all other pollinating insects are being exposed, the bumblebees, the hoverflies, and so on. So we have a kind of a global issue here that we have successfully contaminated the entire global environment with really toxic pesticides. Now that said, sorry, I'll just go back to that for a second. That said, if I was someone who worked for Bayer or Syngenta, the companies that produce these pesticides, I, I would come back and say, ah, but these concentrations are really small. Um, they're not enough to do any harm to bees. It's, modern analytical machinery is very sensitive and can detect tiny traces of chemicals that um, aren't actually enough to do any harm to an insect. Um, and similarly, they've criticized many studies that have been done as using unrealistically high doses of pesticides. So we wanted to know if uh, whether bumblebees exposed to um, a flowering field of oilseed rape um, would actually receive a dose large enough to do them any harm. Um, so we did a simple experiment. This is back in 2012, so it's a few years ago now, and it was done by Penelope Whitehorn, who's there top right, um, who was in my lab at the time. Um, so the question was, if, if a bumblebee nest happened to be near a flowering oilseed rape crop that had been treated with these chemicals, would it do it any harm or would it be just fine? Um, the agrochemical industry said the concentrations were, would be nowhere near enough to harm the bees. And we wanted to know whether that was true. Now, the way we did that was we spiked the food of bumblebee colonies with the concentration of imidacloprid that was found in the nectar and pollen of, uh, of, of treated oilseed rape. And we had control nests and we had a third treatment where we gave them twice the dose. Uh, and we, we spiked their food for two weeks to simulate them being exposed to a flowering crop, which might flower for two or three weeks. And then we put the nests outside and we let the bees look after themselves. They had to collect their own food. And we monitored how well they did uh, and this chart shows you their weight change over time. Um, so the, um, the dotted line at the top is the, they're the control nests, um, which grew most, they became heaviest. Uh, the solid line in the middle are the, the, the nests given a field realistic dose uh, as if they'd been feeding on a treated oilseed rape field. And the ones below that were the ones that received double the dose. So it's a very clear dose related effect. The nests grew less if they were exposed to the pesticide. And they produce far fewer queens. So in bumblebees, the nests die off at the end of the season, at the end of the summer, but they produce new queens to find nests the following year. And that's obviously crucial. Um, but we find even the field realistic low uh, pesticide dose um, produced the nest exposed to it produced 85% fewer queens than the controls. So there really seemed to be quite a profound impact on bumblebee nests. I think I thought that was pretty convincing, but, but our study was criticized uh, on the grounds that we, were, we fed the bees an unrealistically high dose. Um, the agrochemical industry argued that even if a bumblebee nest was next to a, a, a field that had been treated um, the bees wouldn't all feed upon the crop. Some would go and feed on wildflowers uh, and that would dilute the pesticide. So they wouldn't, this was a worst case scenario. It wasn't very real realistic, they said. So we thought, well, okay, what concentrations of pesticides are bumblebees exposed to in the real world if you don't manipulate them? So we put bumblebee nests out into the landscape and then we analyzed the pesticides in their food stores, not just neonicotinoids, but uh, all the different pesticides that were in their food stores. 
Uh, and this shows you just um, what we found in the pollen stores and actually in the bees themselves for bumblebee nests placed in an urban area on the left and in farmland on the right. Um, the black parts of these stacked charts uh, show you the amount of neonicotinoids. This was done in 2015. And then there's also other fungicides and various other compounds there. The spotted parts of those charts are the fungicides that work synergistically with insecticides that I talked about earlier. Anyway, basically you can see that there are a lot of pesticides in the, in the pollen stores of bumblebee nests, just as there were lots of neonicotinoids in the honey stores of honeybee nests from around the world. Now, if I just overlay a red line, that's the concentration of pesticide that we spiked our bumblebee nests with, which we were told was unrealistically high and that bees in the real world wouldn't be exposed to. But actually you can see quite clearly that the black parts of those bars are significantly higher in several nests uh, than the supposedly unrealistically high dose that we found produced an 85% drop in queen production in bumblebee nests. Suggesting that in the real world, bees really do get exposed to enough pesticide to do them harm, essentially. So you might still be thinking, why on earth is this guy talking about neonicotinoids? Because at least as far as Europe is concerned, they've been banned. Well, at the end of 2018, three of them were banned, um, the three that were most used. Um, but two others remain in use in Europe. Um, uh, and in the rest of the world, they're still being used as the, the insecticide of choice. They spray them from aeroplanes in some countries in the Americas. Um, so from a global perspective, these chemicals are still extremely relevant. Um, but even from a European perspective, we should not be complacent that we have solved the problem because the regulatory process that governs new pesticides coming onto the market in Europe hasn't really changed since it allowed neonicotinoids onto the market. It doesn't really assess sublethal effects of the type I talked about. Um, and it doesn't look at all at the combined effects of exposure to more than one chemical at a time. Uh, and it doesn't look at any bees other than honeybees. So there are a number of problems with the, the regulatory process as it stands. And it's perfectly plausible that a new generation of insecticides that are just as harmful to bees as the neonicotinoids may well come to market in Europe any day. It may even have already happened. There have been a number of new insecticides come on to the market in recent years. Got some great names. There are things like flupi, radifurone, and cyanotronilipril, I can't even pronounce it. Um, and some of these new insecticides seem suspiciously similar to neonicotinoids. They also act on the acetylcholine receptors. They're, so they're functionally identical to neonicotinoids, but we're told they're not neonicotinoids because neonicotinoids are out. There's, obviously, there's a bit of a stigma associated with them. So these chemicals are, are assigned to new classes. But I wonder whether in 10 or 20 years time, sufficient evidence won't have accumulated that these two are harming bees and they may eventually be banned, but we just seem to go round and round in circles. So basically I've told you so far that um, insecticides harm bees, which probably is pretty obvious really. I mean, if you spray the landscape with lots of insecticides, of course you're gonna harm some bees, but you could argue that this is a necessary evil, that we need intensive farming to feed the world. And that if some bees die along the way, well, that's just collateral damage that can't be helped. Um, so is it true that this is the only way we can feed the world? And I just wanted to finish off by spending a couple of minutes talking about that, because, because unless we think about this bigger picture, we can't really solve the problem. So, there was a study that came out uh, in 2017, a French study um, of about a thousand farms where they looked at the economics of pesticide use and they concluded that 78% of farms would have been at least as profitable and, and often more profitable if they used less pesticides. 
and that most farms could have cut pesticide use by about 40% without losing any yield at all, um, which is really interesting. And it suggests that not all pesticides are actually doing anything. They're not necessary. You could do without them. But it, maybe farmers struggle to identify which ones those are, but it's certainly, it's, it seems odd, doesn't it? Why would farmers be using pesticides if they didn't need them? Well, well, at this point, if there was a farmer listening, they might say, you know, we're not stupid. We don't, we don't pay for chemicals and spray them on our farm unless we need them. Um, but I would say, well, actually, perhaps you do, because we're all susceptible to being sold things that don't necessarily work. In fact, you could argue that our entire economy is based on selling people things that we don't really need. Um, these are just some silly examples. Apparently there really is such a thing as an armadillo repellent that you can buy in the United States, but it doesn't work. Um, and the others are more well-known examples of things that uh, probably don't work, but we still buy them because they're marketed at us. And that's my point is that farmers are bombarded with marketing and their advice from agronomists is usually from, most agronomists who advise farmers work for pesticide companies. Many of them are on commission or directly employed by pesticide companies. So of course they recommend using lots of pesticides. It doesn't necessarily mean the farmer needs them, but it's really hard for the farmer to know which ones he does need. So maybe we could go to the other extreme and we could get rid of pesticides completely. We could just have organic farming with no pesticides. Wouldn't that be lovely? Well, the counter argument at this point is usually Organic farm yields are lower. And if, if you wanted the world to go organic, then you'd need even more farmland to feed everybody. Um, so, and it's true that organic yields tend to be lower. On average, globally, they're about 80% of the yields of conventional farming. So they're not that much lower, but on the face of it, it would seem to be a valid argument that we would need more farmland to produce the same amount of food. But do we need to produce the same amount of food? So actually right now, globally, we grow about three times as many calories as we need to feed the human population. But we waste about a third of the food we grow. We have this extraordinarily inefficient food system where, whereby a third of the food that's grown in the world is not eaten by anybody, which is ridiculous. And then we feed about a third, another third of the food grown to animals to eat ourselves, which is also hugely inefficient as a way of feeding people. Um, so actually, if you think about it, um, if we're wasting a third of the food and feeding a third of the food to animals, maybe we could go um, organic and still feed everybody. It would also help, of course, and sorry about this next slide, you may wonder, I've got it quite a long way from bees and pesticides here, but um, we also just eat too much. Uh, we have a really poor diet and we eat way more calories than we need. So if we could persuade people to be less wasteful with food, if we could address some of the food wastage in the, in the supply chain, if we could reduce meat consumption and persuade people to treat meat as, a, as a, a nice treat, as a luxury once a week, rather than having it every day, and if we can just persuade people to eat less, then we could easily feed the world without any pesticides at all. But I think rather than just removing pesticides from conventional farming, there are more ambitious things we might consider. Most people have come to accept that industrial farming can't go hand in hand with wildlife conservation. This, the, 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 if you're gonna have huge monocultures with lots of pesticides, um, then inevitably you're gonna have very low biodiversity. But there are examples of food production systems that have high food production and high biodiversity in the same place. And we've been studying one such example in, in my research group in, in Sussex, um, which is allotments. Um, allotments, this is a, a, an allotment, an allotment I think most people are familiar with, but there are many European countries have allotments, which is basically a piece of land that you rent to grow fruit and vegetables on. They're amazingly productive. We've been quantifying food production on allotments and um, allotments can produce, if, if the allotment holder is competent, about 35 tonnes of food per hectare of land. The allotment itself is much smaller than a hectare, but if you scaled it up, 35 tonnes, that compares really well with industrial farming that might produce eight or nine tonnes of wheat per hectare. 
But the really interesting thing, and the reason I'm showing you this picture is because there was a study from the University of Bristol recently, which showed that allotments are the richest places for pollinators in all urban areas. They have extraordinary numbers of pollinators. So they're producing food and supporting biodiversity at the same time. And there are other forms of scaled up forms of agriculture similar to this, using similar principles to allotmenting, um, which I think maybe we should do more of. And that's essentially my point. Things like agroforestry, where you have uh, perennial crops like trees um, in rows and you grow other crops between them, which is a much better way of looking after the soil and supports much more biodiversity as a different kind of agroforestry system in Europe. And things like biodynamic farming, um, I haven't got time to go into the pros and cons of these systems, um, but broadly, they, they seem to be able to produce lots of food at the same time as supporting biodiversity, also permaculture. Look at that. I love that picture. It's so kind of inspirational. It seems to me that it, the world, oh, sorry, that the world would be a much better place if we did a, a lot less of the kind of industrial monoculture cropping and a lot more of growing healthy fruit and veg um, for people to consume in this kind of way. I've wandered way off bees and pesticides, but I hope you could bear with me and thought that that was at least a little bit relevant. Um, thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you so much, Dave. It was a very interesting talk indeed. Don't think about wondering, it was very well connected. And I think all of us that are seeing this wildlife are very interested and very, some, some of them maybe more surprised than others about the effects of pesticides and uh, how everything is interconnected. Um, we have some comments and some questions from the audience. First of all, we have in the audience uh, uh, a fan of uh, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> which was very annoyed to see that Gandalf is a name for an insecticide. I know, it's an outrage, isn't it? He's yeah, a, a, completely. a Freud insecticide, I'm afraid. Yeah, completely. Um, then from the same person, Edward Marubuto, do these chemicals, insecticides and pesticides, pass on to honey and do we bioaccumulate them? So what is the, the prospect in this part for humans when you consume honey? What is the effect that you can expect? Well, certainly honey we know contains mixtures of pesticides. And there have been lots of other studies as well as the one I showed you um, where they've screened for other pesticides. And I think more than 300 different pesticides have been found in total in honeys from one place or another. Um, often the concentrations are quite low and please bear in mind that it's not just honey. Um, there are also pesticides in almost any other food you eat in a loaf of bread, um, unless you buy organic. Um, so, so honey isn't particularly bad. It's just, it's a, it's a convenient way of us seeing what bees are exposed to. And the, the bees do a great job of sampling the landscape. So picking up any pesticides that are out there. Um, but whether it does us any harm is, an open question. There's no clear evidence that the levels of pesticides in honey um, uh, are, are poisoning anybody, um, but I guess most of us feel we'd rather they weren't there. Um, and it's very hard to answer that kind of question. It's very hard to conduct a long-term epidemiological study on people to find out whether being exposed to pesticides in the food we eat for decades, from the, from the day we're born, from in fact the day we're conceived, we're exposed to pesticides. Does that have long-term effects on our health? I think nobody can really say for sure. Um, this is from me. Do you think that we really have nowadays organic food, completely organic? So there have been um, studies of pesticides, foods are often screened for pesticides to see what's in them and organic food is usually free of pesticides occasionally it does get contaminated um, and obviously with these some of the pesticides that are very persistent and that can get into water courses and so on then that could conceivably contaminate an organic farm but the evidence is that, that the pesticide residues in organic food are, are low or, or non-existent 
Okay. Um, the next comment from Annalise Rosa Fontana. Based on your comment published recently in Cell Press, in your opinion, how do scientific papers may influence political decision makers face of this scenario? Sorry, could, could you just... Based on your recent comment in uh, yeah. Cell Press, in your opinion, how do scientific papers may influence political decision and how we face these questions? I, well, often I don't think they do, sadly. I mean, I, an awful lot of scientific papers are published without any um, politician ever reading them or paying any attention to them. Occasionally, if the media picks them up, um, they can end up being taken seriously by politicians. Um, and I, th I mean, a, a, a really nice example is what happened with the um, uh, in, in Germany, in Bavaria, where in part stimulated by that study I showed you at the beginning of insect declines there, there was a big public outcry, lots of media coverage of that study. And it resulted in ultimately in the German government setting aside, I think it's 100 million euros for insect conservation in Germany. Uh, wouldn't it be great if every government did that? But uh, um, so, it, so science can have impacts, but most of the time I think it, it doesn't, sadly. Um, I guess another nice example was the neonicotinoid story that, you know, Europe did eventually ban three neonicotinoids as, as a result of an accumulation of hundreds of scientific studies showing that they were harming bees. But it took a very long time, you know, probably 25 years. So, and in the meantime, the chemicals were harming the environment. Now, it's frustrating as from a science perspective, I, I sometimes tear my hair out for the fact that it's so hard to get politicians to listen. So how can we change and have politicians ears? Ah, good question. I wish I, if only I knew the answer to, to that. I'm afraid I, I, I don't. If someone out there knows, please, please say. <laughs> so there's a, cha a challenge for our audience right now. Absolutely. So from João Vitor, uh, climate change can influence the environmental cues for plants to flower, causing the bees to be out of sync with flowering seasons. Can fertilizers enhance this impact of climate change? Ooh, I mean, certainly fertilizers have profound impacts on, on ecosystems. Um, I mean, the, the most obvious impact of fertilizers that I'm familiar with is um, that, that it, it, it allows a few plant species to outcompete all the others. So you end up with very simplified plant communities with much lower floral diversity. And that certainly impacts on pollinators. Uh, a flower rich hay meadow, if you put fertilizer on it, you ruin it um, because you end up with a lot of green grass and very few flowers. Um, but whether it interacts with climate and with the phenology of flowering of plants relative to the emergence time of bees, I don't know of any studies on that at all. Um, it's a really interesting idea, but I'm afraid I don't know whether whether it's a, whether it's true. And from Michelle Potrick, uh, she's um, she's thanking you for sharing all this information. And she's asking about biological insecticides, such as entomophagic fungi, her, um, and the studies on honeybees. Do you have any information on these? I don't. Sorry again. I'm going to have to. Pass the book on that. I mean, I, obviously, I've heard of, of entomopathic fungi and their use as, as sort of biological pesticides. I, it seems that they have the potential to be much less harmful because some of them are much more specific in in their in the species they will affect. But they still run many of the same risks. And being living organisms, in many cases, then the, there is the potential of, it, of introducing them beyond their natural native ranges uh, and then not being able to get rid of them, which is not a risk with synthetic pesticides. So there are pros and cons, I guess. And for another participant, is it unfair to compare wheat yields against allotment? Yields on simple tonnage, which will presumably contain lots of vegetables with a much higher water weight? Yeah, yeah, it's an excellent point. Very perceptive of uh, somebody in the audience. It's that is true, but nonetheless, it remains the case that uh, you know allotments can produce lots of 
fruit and veg, which is healthy to eat, um, and they can, it can be grown near to where it's going to be consumed. And it seems to me that, that that's a model of food production that, that needs more support. Um, but I, I, I agree. I was cheating slightly in, uh, in, in my comparison there. Well, we have to cheat if no one listens to us, so. <laughs> uh, then you have a lot of people thanking you for the marvelous talk. And um, from Cara, Carla Pereira, sorry, you mentioned that no sublethal effects and no other bees than honeybees that were assessed nowadays. Not yet in vigor, but new EFSA guidance tackles both points. It, it, it does, absolutely, but it hasn't been implemented. So, I mean, that's... The bee guidance document, which includes protocols for addressing all of those things, was, I think, written in 2013 or so. It was a long time ago now. And it has not been implemented because some EU member states have blocked it. And it seems to be the result of lobbying by the agrochemical industry. Uh, so we have, we have a, a system ready to go that would greatly improve the regulatory process, but isn't being used. Um. And also from Carla Pereira, how do you think that the combined effect of pesticides simulating a natural multiple exposure scenario can be integrated in a regulatory process? That's a good question. I mean, it's extremely difficult to study because there are so many possible combinations that you might want to investigate. And, it, you know, every farmer uses different combinations of pesticides, so it's hard to know yeah, you could end up with thousands of different combinations. I, I think the only way you could really do it was is in terms of doing it in the field, um, having a kind of full field trials with real crops being treated with the full range of pesticides and putting bee colonies next to them and, and uh, comparing them to control fields. I, even so, it would be extremely difficult and it would require a lot of resources. It's, it's an almost insoluble problem. Easier to just get rid of the pesticides, if you ask me. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> uh, from David Canario, thank you for your presentation. I don't know if you mentioned it, but you have got an idea how persistent neonicotinoids, ah, sorry, uh, how persistent neonicotinoids could be. I mean, could they be transmitted to descendancy? I don't know if you mean the, to the descendants. To, for the, I don't to think the so. So, so in the environment, they're quite persistent. Um, uh, they can last for years in soil, depends on the soil type. Um, the more organic matter content, the longer they seem to last. Um, there's clear evidence that if they're used every year by a farmer, that they accumulate over time. So the levels in the soil get higher every year. Um, and there are farm, there are fields in the UK that have been screened for imidacloprid five years after the farmer last used it and you could still detect it in the soil. So they, they, they're quite persistent. But I don't think in living organisms like us, um, they um, persist and they, I don't think they're persistent enough to bioaccumulate in the way that DET did historically. Um, so far as I understand the biochemistry of them, we get broken down in our bodies more quickly than we ingest them. Um, it's not to say they don't do us any harm, I don't think anyone really knows, but uh, they, they're not going to build up. And I really don't think they're going to pass on to offspring. So um, that's probably one thing we perhaps don't need to worry about. Okay. I don't know if you are aware, probably you are, that for instance, glyphosate has been measured in, Europe, in several European countries and Portugal is unfortunately one of the champions aware the in human concentration yeah, where you, you have the most glyphosate hooray <laughs> yeah so, i mean glyphosate in, in in most foods these days it's yeah i mentioned bread earlier it's in bread it's in biscuits it's in almost anything made with cereals um uh, and lots of other products too and so and we're all urinating glyphosate uh, yes. and which is really quite concerning when you know, you, you have the admittedly controversial and contested evidence, but nonetheless pretty good evidence that long-term exposure causes cancer. And, you know, and our children are urinating this stuff. That cannot be good. Yeah, it's true. And I think, yes, at least in Portugal, our farmers are very uh, prone to use it. 
And I think also to access, uh, we see the amount, the recommended amount. So that's why we are so high rated in this unfortunate respect. So from Sonia Ferreira, she's thanking you for the talk. And do you know if any campaigns were made to bring awareness on the pet products with pesticides of the different kinds available in the market and the risks involved? Uh, the, so this is the, the yeah the flea treatment. So yeah. watch this space because we are just about to submit a paper on this subject, uh, which um, when it's published in a few months' time, um, I think will form the, a springboard for a campaign to raise awareness about this issue because it's something most people are completely unaware of, um, uh, and we. Have more evidence, which I didn't show you today, suggesting that rivers are being contaminated with these flea treatments. Um, so, for example, in the UK, as well as using imidacloprid, um, one of the alternative flea treatments is fipronil, which is a similar chemical, which I didn't mention today, but it's a very toxic insecticide. Um, it's, it has no other uses in the UK other than as a flea treatment, and you can detect it in 98% of UK rivers which is really concerning. So these flea treatments basically seem to be contaminating the environment in a big way. Um, and uh, hopefully if we, this may be one of those examples, I'm fingers crossed where a scientific publication leads to some political action. Uh, that would be the ideal. Um, it's, uh, there certainly needs to be. Yeah, for sure. Let us know when the paper comes out so we can start talking about it here as well to raise awareness in Portugal and everywhere else. Uh, I think uh, I just forgot one question in the news. From Miguel Andrade, do you think the use of pesticides in certain agricultural crops and the posterior declining of bee populations can produce consequences in crops where pollinators are needed? Sorry, could you say that the line's a bit, a bit difficult? Yeah, okay. So do you think that the pesticides that we are now using for certain crops and that probably are uh, causing bee declines, can they uh, produce consequences in other crops, in other systems? Sure. Uh, I mean, obviously, bee declines are happening at the kind of a landscape level. Um, and so that is going to have consequences for, for crops, even, even for potentially for an, an organic farmer. If he's surrounded by um, conventional farmers who are killing all the bees on their land, um, then he's going to have reduced pollinator populations on his land or her land. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, because the pollinator populations are, are declining on globally, so far as we know, um, then inevitably there are going to be consequences for all crops, whether or not those crops themselves are treated with pesticides. And finally, do you have any idea how dangerous adjuvants present in pesticides could be on pollinators? And also, have you got uh, an idea of the impact of new alien pests in Europe could have on, and uh, their impacts on pollinators? So the whole adjuvant thing is really interesting, and, and, uh, but so little research has been done. Basically, for, for anyone who doesn't know what they are, um, every pesticide that is and when it's used by a farmer, it's actually a formulation with a mixture of one or more active ingredients, plus a whole bunch of other chemicals, which are supposedly inert. But the evidence is clear that they're not inert. Um, I did recently referee a paper. I'm not, I guess it's not published yet, so I'm not allowed to tell you the exact details, but it was really interesting. It was basically on the effects of a very well-known herbicide um, on bumblebees, and it showed that the formulated product was in the region of 100 times more toxic to uh, bumblebees than the active ingredient alone, um, which is really interesting. Um, so, and uh, obviously shows that these, these adjuvants have really big effects on the, on the toxicity of the chemicals, which is another problem with the regulatory process, of course, because usually that focus is just on the, the active ingredient, not the actual formulation that is what farmers actually spray. And now to finalize, I promise, two small provocations. <laughs> uh, 
One is, uh, what do you think will be the impact of Brexit in the UK in these regards? Lord knows. Um, I mean, we have not got a clue what we're doing. I think it's fair to say. On the one hand, we were promised a green Brexit and theoretically being free of the common agricultural policy might mean that we could introduce some really interesting new progressive subsidy systems supporting more sustainable farming methods, theoretically. Um, or we might do a trade deal with Donald Trump and throw all of our environmental standards out of the window and, and wipe out all of our wildlife out. We don't know. Um, obviously, those of us that are kind of um, do a bit of campaigning are trying to push things in. It's, it's, a, it's a good, you know, there's, there's great potential at this point in time for both good and bad. And, and it's really hard to predict where it'll go. I hope it will be for the former, not the latter. Let's forget about the long term. Let him be the United States. Yeah, we'll see. And then the other small provocation from a fellow fan of your books, Marta Calix, that she's asking if you have any other books coming. Yes. Uh, so there's, there's one, Gardening for Bumblebees, which is a kind of practical DIY gardening guide coming out uh, next year. But also next year, there is a, um, a, a book about insect declines, um, which might be a bit depressing. It's called Silent Earth. Um, uh, and I've nearly finished it. So hopefully it'll be out in April next spring. Excellent news. And then they're coming, they keep coming, sorry. <laughs> Um, do you believe that natural kinds of farming have a chance in at least national healing of the environment if the scientific community gathers to make them known to farmers? Um, I, I do think that we need to completely rethink our whole food production system and that there are ways of growing food that are properly sustainable and compatible with supporting rich wildlife. You know, I, I touched on some of them very briefly, but how do we get there? How do we move away from the current farming system? That's really difficult. Um, I, I, I don't know how we persuade farmers to change. There are various ways it might be done. One would be obviously if politicians said, this, this is what we want, and they changed the subsidy system, the, the, you know, because farming in Europe is so heavily subsidized, especially taxpayers' money, given to farmers we can we can say what we want for that money and if instead of subsidizing industrial farming which is what we've done for the last 50 years we said okay we're only from now i mean just to give a very simplistic example you could give all those subsidies to organic farming to say we're not going to subsidize anything apart from organic then overnight farmers would would mostly become organic uh, uh, or if we could persuade everyone that goes to the shops to only buy local seasonal or organic produce, then there'd be no market for all the industrial rubbish full of pesticides and farmers would change. So I, you know, it, either way would work effectively, but it would, how do we persuade politicians to change the policies? How do we change shoppers to en masse change their shopping preferences? Difficult, but, you know, that, that's the challenge. We need to get people to realize that the, the choices they make when they go shopping actually have consequences. And, you know, if we could persuade enough people of the risks associated with, with um, intensively produced food with lots of pesticides in it and, and so on to their own health, if we can make people aware of the fact that they're all urinating glyphosate, for example, then maybe they might start to think more carefully about what they buy and that, you know, could have huge positive effects. It's unfortunate that glyphosate doesn't make us pee in a different color or something like that, <laughs> that will scare everyone away from it. Yes, that would be good. Yeah. From, from what I've seen recently, just so that I thought, I think bottom-up uh, uh, opportunities will be more, um, more, reliable in, more reliable in the future than uh, top-down. So change people's attitude, make people change politicians. But uh, it's a thought. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm trying my best. If everyone else is listening, does their best too. Maybe we'll get somewhere. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dave. It's been a pleasure.
been a um, pleasure. Sorry about the hiccups at the beginning. No, it's okay. Uh, we are Portuguese, so we we understand uh, we understand everything about hiccups and technical problems and everything is. We have here seventy people following us uh, now, and others who have been the, here before, so it's okay. Um, I was just want to to say to thank everyone here, our audience, everyone in the backstage, Marta Santos, Maria Castanheira, everyone that has contributed with very interesting questions and uh, in more interesting even your, your answers and things that le were left for us to think about for the future. And I want everyone to, to invite everyone to come back tomorrow for a different talk. This way will be, tomorrow it will be in Portuguese. It will be Ricardo Costa talking about an endemic species from Madeira Island and its pollinators. And um, I think that's all for, for today. See you tomorrow. <laughs>